Good morning, everyone. So it's a little different this morning, isn't it? Without the organ booming, we have the soft, dulcet sounds of Pat James's playing, which is wonderful. We just, it, this is the first time in about two years that Charlie has taken a vacation to be away on a Sunday. So we hope that he is having a great time. So just a little, little different on a Sunday morning. So, but we welcome you here. We're glad that you're here to be able to to join us in the worship of God, and we'll start off with a few announcements. Um, later on today, we have youth group at six o'clock, so if there are any kids um, in junior high, and oh, there's a bug flying around. Better than a bat, let's just say that, so... <laughs> <laughs> so six o'clock is youth group this evening. Um, Monday we have our table. The next our table is coming up um, five to six tomorrow. Again, that's for anybody who would like to have a hot meal with a, a good good group of people. Um, so come at five o'clock tomorrow if you'd like. Finance meeting is at six thirty in Cushing Hall. On Tuesday we have the care team at one thirty. Staff parish meets at five thirty, and the ad board meets um, at seven p.m. in. Cushing Hall as well. Uh, then let's see. Well, I'll, I'll get into the others in just a little bit. Change the world for October. All the money will be given to the Second Story Teen Center. They're, they are going to be building a new building there on Main Street, so that will hopefully be able to help. Um, what, what we give will be able to help them in, in, their, in what they're trying to accomplish. Um, we continue to lift up food help for the Couts family, for Paul and Nancy, as they go through their health issues. Um, you can either look at the Mealtrain.com website, or you can call our office if you would like to be able to get something scheduled to bring them a meal. Our next Saturday evening casual service comes up two weeks from yesterday. Uh, that'll be on the 21st. It begins at 5.30. <laughs> Poor Henry. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have two wonderful mission moments coming up um, here uh, today. We have De Denise Erig from the Senior Center. She will be presenting in just a little bit about some of the things that, that they are able to provide for seniors in our community. And next Sunday, we will have Jeff Van Autry for, from Second Story to tell us about the youth side of things. This coming Saturday is the next Feed My Starving Children mission event. So anyone who would like to join us, um, we are going in um, again on Saturday. We'll meet here in the parking lot at 11 a.m., go into the suburbs, eat, eat a meal, and then we'll pack from 2 to about 4 and then come back. Anybody age 5 on up can go. It counts towards... Um, High, the high schoolers, they have to get service hours. It counts for that. So we, I will need to send all the information in by Tuesday. So if anybody wants to go that hasn't signed up yet, please consider signing up or talking to me um, by Tuesday. We have some new members that will be joining the church next week, next Sunday, so please be here to, to support them. Red Cross Blood Drive is coming up on Thursday, October 19th from 11.30 to 5.30. Best to sign up online for that. The Young at, Heart's friend, Young at Heart Friends Group um, went to Tanner's Orchard on Wednesday. I think there were 20, 22 people that went. To that. The next thing coming up is on Wednesday, November 1st, there's a potluck meal at noon in Cushing Hall. There's also a sign-up sheet for that on the table outside the office. And then the next big thing is on Sunday, December 3rd, um, there's a group. We have 40 tickets available to go to see Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, a musical down in East Peoria. It's on a Sunday afternoon, and um, the cost is $19 each, but I understand it should be good. Um, and so... Sign up on the sheet um, outside the office for that as well. Last thing, November 5th is All Saints Sunday. And if you have someone who that you've known and loved and would want to and have passed away in the last year, the last calendar year, please let us know. You can bring us a, a picture and we'll make sure to include their name and picture as we remember those people um, on the 5th. I think that's it. So let's bow our heads. We'll have our focusing prayer as we begin our worship of God. Ever-powerful Lord, you have placed us in the vineyard of your world to tend and care for your creation. You've called us to be a fruitful people, ones who do something positive with their lives. 
So grant that we may hear your voice and understand the guidance you provide. Set before us goals we can attain and prizes to claim. We praise you for all these opportunities and blessings. It is through Christ that we pray. Amen. And now I would invite you, if you are able, to stand and we'll join Liz in our responsive call to worship that this week we can actually see on the screens. Come on. <laughs> it's okay. Come away to the sanctuary of the Lord for a while. Stand apart from your daily pace to feel God's presence. Life's, Life's blessings are more than we can count. The, the beauty and peace of heaven are beyond our imagination. Sing aloud to God, our strength and our defender. Shout for joy to the one who listens and does what is best for us. God has given us an example to follow. In, in Christ, Christ, we are enabled to live at our best. And if you'll please remain standing as you're able for our opening hymn number 140, Great is Thy Faithfulness, the first three verses of 140. <laughs> pumpkin you've got that right you are totally right okay whoops wait Hannah you, oh, okay well one's leaving one's coming further up okay so 
Do any of you have one of these outside of your house? No. Okay, well, there goes my children's message. So, no. <laughs> so, if you don't have one out there yet, do you think you might be getting one to maybe carve a pumpkin? Yes. Yes. Okay. What is a carved pumpkin called? A jack-o'-lantern. A jack-o'-lantern. Anastasia, you got that, didn't you? Very good. Okay. What, do you know why it's called that? Because it lights up. What, how does it light up? When you put a candle inside of it, when yeah. you put a candle inside of it. Typically, there's a candle or a flashlight or something like that, yes? Can I buy that? No, you can't buy that. <laughs> no. Uh, if you don't get one, then I'll be happy to give it to you, but you're not going to have to buy it, okay? We'll see as we get closer to Halloween, okay? So, before we make it into a jack-o'-lantern and carve a funny face in it or something, what do you think had to be done to make this pumpkin? What had to, okay, before you carve it, before, before we even got to see this, what had to happen? You had to take out, take out the stuff inside. Well, okay, no, be, be, we'll go way back further than that. Let's go back to the spring, okay? Before this came about, what needed to happen before we even get to this? Plant a seed and care for it and then wait for it to grow. You are absolutely right. There are all those things that had to happen. So oftentimes farmers are the ones who do that, but I know that my mom even put some out and she got some pumpkins. Um, so God gives us the opportunity to do that, but we're the ones who have to do that, right? But we have to take care of and do the hard work of caring for the earth and its plants. Yes? One time in, um, in first, well, one time when I was in school, someone brought in a pink pumpkin. A pink pumpkin? Yeah. Do you think they had painted it, though? No, it was like, light, like, it was like, Pink mixed in with white. My goodness, was almost fully white. Well, that's pretty amazing. I have never seen a pink and white pumpkin, so I'll have to look for that one. Okay, so in the big people's in the big people's sermon today, we're going to be hearing about a story about a person who planted um, a vineyard, which is where grapes come from, and then there were all kinds of bad things that happened to it. And the, the, the um, grapes probably weren't taken care of in the way that they should have been. How do you think the landowner would feel about that if they trusted that there would be a lot of fruit, like pumpkins or grapes, and they never got, got it never came to be? And Anastasia? She will be mad. She will, she will be mad. Very mad. You are right. Exactly. Well, in the parable, the landowner is God, and God expects us to take care of the things that were given us. So if we were given pumpkin seeds, and we just decided, oh, I think it's going to be fun to place them on my dresser beside my desk. Do you think that's what God wanted us to do with those? No. no. So whoever grew this pumpkin did exactly what they were supposed to, right, Aiden? Yep. Okay. <laughs> You do. You do have to put water on a pumpkin seed as well as have it in dirt. So whoever did it, God would be very proud of them with this pumpkin, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Very cool. So whether we make jack-o'-lanterns or whether we just get to see a lot of cool pumpkins as we get closer to Halloween, let's remember that that is a, a very good thing. Okay, if it's real quick, here we go. And you need to feed them and give them a drink too. That is true. You're right. Okay, Anastasia? I used to have a pumpkin bowl. That was must. Okay, thank you. Okay, guys, you guys can head up to a Sunday school, the nursery, or, or well, you're gone. So, <laughs> guess I didn't need to do anything more with that. So, <laughs> and there's Emma. Okay, so at this time, so before I invite Denise to come forward, um, I will just say that we. If you will notice, we are not having choir or bell choir for the month of October. The reason for this is not because you've booed us off the stage or anything like that. It is because Kira Newby, who is our director of both choirs, is currently in Africa. 
So she got to, the chance to go back to Africa, and so for this month, we will not be having that, that special music, but we will start it up again in November. So at this time, um, I'm very excited to be able to welcome to our pulpit Denise Erig, who is the director of the Bureau County Senior Center, and she is going to be sharing with us some information about what the Senior Center here in Princeton offers and what we can partake of. So come forward, Denise. Can we give her a round of applause for being here? Pastor Ryan, I want to tell you one thing about my pumpkins. My squirrels love them. Oh, yes. I, I just want to stay that little part. Yes. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for your invitation to come speak to you today. Hi, Marion about the Barrow County Senior Center. I feel like this is a Senior Center reunion. There's a lot of you out here that already know what we do and where we're at, but I'm happy to share with you some things that we have going on right now. We are open to everyone, every senior age 60 and over in Barrow County. Um, Right now, we're getting ready for open enrollment. A lot of you are uh, thinking about your prescription drug plan for Medicare. We offer that service to help you look into that. We have a lot of activities that go on. So I have out here in your little hallway on the table some calendars, um, newsletters, information for you all to take home, look over. Hi, Joyce. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'd like to get off on things because I'd love to talk. When Pastor asked me about coming to talk to you today, he told me I had five minutes. And a lot of you know me well enough that five minutes is just like, oh my goodness. We do do a lot of things. I have wonderful staff at the Senior Center. We've been there since 1981. We're located in the lower level of the Clark House. We don't call it the basement. We call it the lower level. It makes us all feel good down there. Um, we offer an outreach program where I have a young lady that comes out to your home, sits and visits with you, and discusses what um, services we might be able to get for you, um, assist you in order to keep you in your home. That is the ultimate goal for us in the senior centers, to help you be able to stay in your home. We offer a transportation program, so when you need to go to the doctor, go to the hairdresser, you want to come in and see us and you need a ride, we're there. You just call us, we'll schedule your ride, we'll come pick you up, bring you, take you wherever you want to go, and then we'll take you back home. Um, Wednesdays we have a shopping day. We'll pick you up at your home and we'll take you out to Walmart, Sullivan's, Dollar Tree, the closet, anywhere you want to go. Wednesday's the day for that. I have a young lady at the Senior Center who offers information and assistance. That's about, um, consists of helping you with Medicare, Medicaid. Um, we have a license plate sticker discount program. If you qualify, you can get your discount uh, sticker on your plate. For $10, you don't have to pay the 150 some dollars for your license plate sticker. But there are income guidelines, so I want to make sure that you are aware of that. And that information is out here on the uh, table in the hallway. Please feel free to take it. One of the big things that we have going again at the Senior Center is that we are now offering a congregate meal site. So that means we get to invite you in, you come in, you have lunch with us, socialize, make some new friends. And uh, we do that Monday through Friday. A lot of you have come in and do come in to have lunch with us, and we're happy to have you. Something that we have going on coming for Thanksgiving, and I don't want to get it confused with what the local churches do on Thanksgiving Day, but the Senior Center has been doing this, I think, at least I know, for 16 years, 17 years that I have been there. Um, we have our annual Thanksgiving Day di or Thanksgiving dinner. I can tell you that that's going to be November 10th. We're going to celebrate the veterans and we're going to have a Thanksgiving feast. Um, so if you'd like to participate in that, there is no charge for that dinner. It is going to be held again at the Hampshire Colony Church. They have graciously opened up their kitchen to us and uh, their bigger room that we, than we have um, so we can host more folks to come in and have lunch. We'll have a program. So if you haven't made your reservation, I, I ask that you call us at the Senior Center, 
That number is 879-3981. It's in the news on the table out here and all of the information that we have. And make your reservation and come have lunch with us. It is the full Thanksgiving dinner. Um, so I do want to let you know on that. Um, how am I doing on time? <laughs> I want you to know that we do have a new program that's come out. Um, it's to help folks caregivers. So if you are a caregiver to someone who has dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy bodies, we have assistance for you. We can help you. Um, we have been the backing to the community of Princeton to become the 26th community in the state of Illinois to be known as a dementia-friendly community. I am very proud of that. That has been a long, a lot of work. We have um, brought area groups together. Um, our city is, you know, you'll see these little decals on uh, public transportation, our vehicles. Um, the city has them on their vehicles. They're placed throughout the town. They have all been gone through the dementia friend training that I provide, the banks. Um, and if you're interested in knowing more about that program, reach out to me at the Senior Center. I do periodically offer a Dementia Friends training. It's one hour. You come to the Senior Center or I come to your business and we get you to be recognized as another organization or business in the city of Princeton as a dementia friendly community um, business. We're very excited about that. We've uh, uh, coordinated an, another uh, caregiver group and that meets at the library so we are very busy um, looking for new things um, wanting to increase our services we want to reach all of you seniors out there so if you have any questions please call us at the Senior Center um, we're here to help you um, and like I said I have other information out there in the hallway, it's yours for the taking. It gives you a list of all the services that we provide. We do have a lending closet that has commodes, walkers, wheelchairs, crutches, um, shower chairs. We still have that going on as well. You need it, we'll loan it, no cost. As, and I guess the last big thing I'm gonna say to you is that all of our services at the Bureau County Senior Center are by donation only. We do not charge you seniors for anything. Um, the Older Americans Act tells me that I, may, I cannot charge you for any of the services I provide. I will work very hard in getting you everything that you need in order to keep you in your home and keep you active. We have exercise classes, but we are there and we're all about our wonderful seniors. Okay, and again, I want to just say thank you very much for letting me come today. I think I'm getting the five minutes is coming. So anyway, thank you very much. Enjoy your day and come see us at the Senior Center. We'd love to have you. Thank you so much, Denise. It's wonderful to know that we have such a great resource here right in our own town and that we can, we can partake in that and make sure that we can do what we can to, as you said, stay in our own homes and be able to have those services that we need. So thank you so much for being with us. Liz, if you wouldn't mind, if you'll come forward and read for us our first scripture reading. It comes from the book of Exodus, various verses out of chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against the neighbor. 
you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male, or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance, and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you, so that you do not sin. Thank you so much. And if you are able, if you would rise as we hear our gospel lesson for today. This is Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46, the words of Jesus. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produce the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The gospel lesson this week is not a fun or easy passage to preach on. In fact, my preaching ideas guide said, quote, this is a biblical text that, if preached on, is going to make people uncomfortable. There's really no feel-good, touchy-feely approach to this text. This is challenging and prophetic material. In fact, the preacher who preaches on this text probably has just been called to a new church. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> Well, I can tell you that I don't think that I'm being moved on to a new one. I just think sometimes it is good to challenge yourself. And evidently, this parable was important enough to God and the early church to have it included in the Bible. So although its content may be a bit awkward, let's see what we can learn from it today. Although living in Princeton is not without difficulties, the recent spat of hospital and healthcare shutdowns are just one example. One has to admit there are many, many advantages to living in rural small towns. There aren't many traffic jams, save for Main Street when there are festivals playing. You can see the stars and hear the crickets at night. If you forget your wallet at home, people will even let you leave your grocery cart full of items and it'll still be there when you return 15 minutes later with money in hand. I know this is true from firsthand experience. <laughs> One of the other perks of living rurally is that home costs aren't nearly what they are in the big city. For example, this past summer, the average standalone house sold for about $140,000 in Princeton. In New York City, the average was $719,000 for a single family home. Just a bit more expensive there. And even in renting apartments, there is a big difference. 
In Princeton, you'll spend about $600 per month for a one-bedroom apartment. What do you think that would cost in New York City? A bit more. The average is $4,000 per month. It was about $3,000 until COVID, and then it jumped up. $4,000 a month for a one-bedroom apartment. That works out to an average of about $78 per square foot rented each month. It's just amazingly expensive. Now, I personally am so blessed to live in a beautiful, spacious parsonage that's probably around 2,000 square feet. That would cost $156,000 per month at that rate. A little beyond my pastor's salary, I'd say. But because I live in such a nice house, I'm always intrigued how people live in small spaces. In college, I lived in one room with a roommate, but I have to say I really didn't like it. I much prefer open spaces. My first few apartments were essentially two rooms with a bathroom in between them, but that's nothing compared to many apartments I've seen on some of those world's smallest apartment shows. While officially, officially, New York City states that a studio apartment must be at least 150 square feet, according to the internet, the smallest available apartment in New York City is a whopping 55 total square feet. It still costs $1,400 per month. If you have a small sofa, it would fit. Your bed is a loft that rests above everything else. I will also say, though, you do not have a bathroom included in this. You have to share the toilet and shower with others on your floor. Again, I am thankful for where I currently live. But even with those prices, there are absolute horror stories that renters have about NYC apartments and their landlords. Now, I know we have some landlords in our congregation, so I'm sure none of these situations apply to them. But it is true that throughout history, there have been some not-so-nice landlords. Everyone wants to feel safe and comfortable in their home, but that's really hard to do when there are rats rummaging around in the cupboards, cockroaches scuttling over the bedroom floor, questionable characters meeting in the lobby of the building, and a constant drip, drip, drip from the water faucet that you called the landlord about a year and a half earlier. Unfortunately, none of those things are that unusual in the city that never sleeps. Maybe that's why it's called that. You don't want to go home to sleep in such deplorable conditions. And even with all those things wrong with them, apartments in those conditions still go for about $2,500 a month, all so that you can say you live in New York City. The conditions in some areas of that city got so bad that about 10 years ago, the government started publishing a yearly account of the worst landlord offenders. The current year's list is 626 buildings that have either hazardous or immediately hazardous conditions, totaling over 69,000 open code violations. This way, potential renters can check to see if the building under consideration is one that they really want to stay away from. There's also information on that website that informs tenants where to file grievances and what their rights are. The assumption is that allegations are checked out, and if the landowners actually make improvements, their score goes up, and they can get off this naughty list. If they don't, fines start mounting up. To be honest, though, such difficulties are nothing new. Evidently, 2,000 years ago, even without high-rise apartment buildings, and probably even way before that, there have been difficulties between landlords and tenants. There are always additional things to be fixed, rent that is late, parties that are too loud, and not enough money to update the kitchen. Jesus wouldn't have used this example as a parable if it wasn't a common experience even in his day. The interesting thing about this story, though, is that it's told about uncaring tenants and not a wayward landowner. This would have been different from the tale Jesus' audience expected to hear. In their society, the rich took everything they could. Here, it's the land renters who misbehave. 
and it's a rather chilling tale indeed. Now, I would say the majority of Christians think of this parable as an allegory for what happened to Jesus himself. God wanted his people to produce good fruit after giving them everything they needed, but the people chose to do what they wanted, rebelled, and didn't give God what he was due. In the end, despite being warned, the chosen ones even killed the son of the landowner, thinking they will have it all then. But they misjudged the one bigger than them, and he gave the land over to others who do what he instructs. Of course, we Christians react almost positively to this story, realizing, well, it's only a parable. The outcome was that we now share in the inheritance of heaven because we believed in God's Son while others didn't. And yes, we did benefit from mistakes of the past. However, there must have been a reason why the early Christians wanted this tale from Jesus included in what we remember from his life on earth. Remember that parables were timeless stories that people should learn from. They weren't historical events. So if we choose to read this as only a page in history, we miss what Jesus wanted his followers to understand, that we need to be careful the same thing does not happen to us. And we can, even today, learn something from this parable. One thing we would be wise to remember is that nothing should be taken for granted. The landowner thought his tenants would take care of it, his property wisely and follow the rules. The tenants thought they could do what they wanted and everything would still be fine in the end. It didn't work out great for either party in this story. For even the safest bet is a bet on the unknown. If you're around me much, you'll know that I have an affinity for the French. Their language was one of my college majors, and I got to spend a semester in college over there studying the tongue and culture. Thus, whenever I can share a French illustration, I do. In the history of landlords, I would think that André-Francois Raffré is about the unluckiest ever. He was a French attorney, and in 1965, he signed a contract to buy the apartment of 90-year-old Jean-Jean Calment in Arles, which is a town in southern France. But because he was really nice, he gave her the right to live in the place until she died, even though she owned it. He, He owned it. Remember, she was 90 years old. However, Madame Calmet defied all odds, living 32 more years. At the time of her death in 1997, at the age of 122, she was the oldest human being ever confirmed, meaning they actually had her birth certificate and everything. She outlived even the landlord who died two years before her at age 77. Even worse than that, though, was the fact, even worse that he never got to live in the apartment that he bought, was the contract requirement that Monsieur Raffre pay his tenant a small monthly stipend. The attorney's wife had to continue paying it even after her husband died. And by that time, the Raffres had paid Madame Calment more than double the purchase price of the property. I guess at times you just make a bad business decision, But I think Mr. Raffre realized that after a few years, he had assumed something that was not turning out as expected. We must always remember that this life has no guarantees. God has told us that things will be wonderful in the future, but didn't say that for what we deal with right now. We can expect that this job, this relationship, this bank account will always have what we need, but that won't always be true. The only thing we can always count on, besides the proverbial death and taxes, is the love of God to support us. The one who created us told us he'll never forget nor forsake us during the good times, during the bad times. So just like the tenants and the landowner in the parable learned, life does not provide many guarantees, but we can count on the Lord to provide what we need. A second thing to consider is what God has blessed us with 
and what we are to do with it. I know that we have both renters and landowners in this congregation. I personally have only owned one house in my life, and that was for about six months total. After Dad passed the month that I arrived in Princeton, my brother and I were willed his house in Kentucky. After we made the decision that we weren't going to keep it in the family, we put it up for sale thinking it would take a long time to unload. We got an offer within three days and sold it in a week. So our last Thanksgiving in Dad's house was actually spent frantically packing. So I have never, ever had to pay a single installment of real estate taxes in my life. While there are good things and bad things about being renters and owners, one thing we all need to remember is that God, God is the rightful owner of everything. Even if we do own land, we don't take it with us when we die. God is the one who made it, and eventually it'll be his again. We are simply caretakers of everything in our possession. We may own something, but really it's only ours while we have it. We're called to use it wisely and do what we can to make God proud of how we handle it. It makes a difference in how we look at what we have in front of us. If we're renters, do we look at the place where we live as something we can do with whatever we want to, as with no regards, that, well, it's the owners who have to fix everything so we can just treat it horribly? No, we should not, because in actuality, it's God who owns it, and we're devaluing his property if we trash it. And if we're owners of anything, be it property, car, a baseball bat, really we are caretakers of what God created. If we always kept that in mind, what a difference it might make in how we treat everything in this world. Lastly, it shouldn't take an uncomfortable parable to make us look at what we're doing with the spiritual side of our lives. What do we have to show for what God has blessed us with? There's been a term coined, spiritual squatters. We take what God has given us for free, and then we just sit on it. We don't do much with it. Instead of working with the great landlord to make our place in this world better, we just grab it, hold on tight, use it only for ourselves, and we don't use it as the Lord intended, to move God's kingdom forward and to make life better for ourselves, but also better for others. So we just take what's given and we sit on it, not using gifts, not giving God much of anything in return. This, of course, can be seen in terms of money, but it's not just that. It's also about our gifts and talents provided that we hoard only for our own enjoyment or that we simply hide them because we're too busy doing other things. It is vitally important that we don't remain spiritual squatters of the gifts that our good God gives us. They are to be used for our enjoyment as well as for the good of others. So here we are, at the end of a sermon based on a difficult piece of scripture. While it might be more fun to always hear about how God is with us in the 23rd Psalm, or maybe I should have gone with the ever-popular Ten Commandments, which Liz read for us, I think it's important that we sometimes tackle the hard stuff. And hearing that we can improve as both tenants and landowners can be hard to take when we think we're pretty decent already. But the truth is that we can all become better. Better at respecting the people and things around us. Better at using the gifts and talents God's given us. Better at not taking things for granted and leaning upon God for guidance and comfort. May the message this morning challenge you to do the best you can with what God gives you. And may you understand the importance of being both tenant and landlord. I leave you with this final thought from Joseph Jefferson. We are only tenants here, and shortly the great landlord will give us notice that our lease has expired. May that not be a scary thing, but a joy that we've been given so much to use here and have a wonderful eternity to look forward to. Amen. 
And at this time, I will invite you to sing our middle hymn, which is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It's the chorus that's found in uh, the hymnal 349 or up on the screen. We'll sing it through two times, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And at this time, I'm going to invite Bernie Brown to come forward. He's going to be giving us a, a short report on um, our memorial's dedication. We usually do this in the springtime, but schedules just didn't work out. And so we're pleased to be able to invite Bernie forward to give the report at this time. I don't want to follow Denise. Can I come back next week? No. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We'd like to take a moment to remember those members that have passed away during the last year to 18 months. They left a void in so many different ways, but their memories live on. Ryan, would you mind saying a few words? If you'll please bow your heads with me. Loving God, we thank you so much for those who have gone to be back home with you for eternity. We thank you for those that have been, uh, who have gone back recently, as well as those who have been gone for many, many years, for their influence still lives on. And we thank you for these memorials that have been given um, so freely by their families to be able to provide something new and good and exciting and for ministry in our church. So as Bernie tells us about these gifts, may you bless the memory of the one who passed on, but also those who have made it possible that we could have these as ministry tools in our church. Through Christ we pray. Amen. We thank the members we lost for all they did for family, church, and community. Just as a refresher, the purpose of the memorial committee is to keep memories of past members and to preserve those memories. We receive money from families and friends of loved ones who've passed away. Funds are usually collected at funerals or after and can be either designated or undesignated. Donations help us to make improvements to worship and ministries that occur. We look to those that in the past have made it possible for us and future generations to have a beautiful place to, to worship. If you'll turn or if you'll look at the handout that uh, Jim and Sharon Smith gave you before the service, uh, the first two words, two thirds of the page um, is just information about the Memorial Committee. The bottom third has to do with the um, the items that were dedicated or purchased this year. And um, also, the, the funds were used in memory of, and I'll give you that behind the, uh, the, the purchase. Um, we uh, participated in the, the purchase of the uh, electric front sign, and um, we gave a fairly substantial amount for us. And that was in memory of Roger Swan, Bill Anson, Bob Gustafson, Bob Knoll, 
Brooke Stanberry, Lewis Olson, Kevin Borg, and Bobby Johnson. We had uh, a new nativity set uh, last Christmas, and that was in memory of Dale DeRose and Lynn Klingenberg. We had a, uh, a fire alarm update this year that was in memory of Richard Heaton. An altar runner was purchased in uh, memory of Marv Peterson, Peters, I'm sorry, and uh, altar flowers were purchased in memory of Dale Borg. We also contributed uh, a fair amount for us uh, to the kitchen remodel, and that was in memory of Ellen Gower, Nell Stratton, Richard Lorenzen, Betty Becker, and True Walgren. There's, there's one item that I, I missed, and I apologize for that. Uh, we um, provided funding for the bell choir uh, to purchase some music for them, and um, that was in memory of uh, Gary James. We have Cushing, uh, I'm sorry, we have blinds, window blinds for Cushing Hall. Uh, that you'll probably appreciate because I know for those of you that have meetings during the day, when the sun's shining, it's pretty difficult to see. Uh, those blinds have been on order for two months, and it'll probably be another month to six weeks before they're uh, installed, and that's be primarily because of the COVID. Um, there are some ascrits by uh, some of the items that we purchased, uh, which has other, other donated other donors also, and uh, there were a number of dona uh, donors for these various projects, uh, and some were very substantial. And that was uh, above and beyond the memorial committee. We thank the members who, lo uh, who we lost for all, well, I've already said that, I'm sorry. Uh, just as a refer, I'm on the wrong page. We have uh, additional requests for funding, which has been approved at our last meeting, and uh, those projects will move forward. Um, one is uh, the purchase of new uh, PA system for the sanctuary, and the other is for uh, an update of furniture to the North X, which Vicki refers to as a welcome center. I'm not sure Vicki's with us, okay. Um, also additional monies were given for or in memory of other past members, but we didn't need those funds for projects this year. Uh, those funds will be used uh, at a later date for sure. <clears throat> and, and those uh, gift stars are those uh, that the funds were given in memory of will have their names uh, published at some future time. <clears throat> if you or any um, committee you're on need uh, items uh, that would help beautify the church, uh, please um, contact any member of the uh, Memorial Committee, and those members are Barb Skeen, Kelly Loftus, Sharon Smith, Jim Smith, Kathy Jessen, um, Margaret Palmer, Betty Sutliff, Lorraine Cabral, and myself. And in closing, the past members live on. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie, very much, and we do appreciate all those um, members and their family members that made it possible for memorials to be given um, after they passed. We truly appreciate it. So we will now, I think Bernie, you took my, 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 um, but I'll just follow up there, so no problem. The next thing coming up are joys and concerns. I was right on that. So uh, joys and concerns, we've got a lot of them, so let me go through them. We want to say a few, <laughs> okay. But Denise didn't do it. You just did it. So, um, 
We have a couple of birthdays to, to recognize. It's Glenda Johnson's birthday today, so congratulations to her. And my uncle Kurt had his birthday this week as well. It was Both of these are, I think, pretty memorable ones. I'm not going to say it because they're older than 19. So, um, But congratulations to them on their birthdays. Um, we want to keep Mick Dow in our prayers. That is Sandy Helberg's nephew. He has open-heart surgery scheduled for this Wednesday. I got a call from Joanne Creason this morning. She has been not feeling well for a good long time. She has bronchitis um, and is very weak right now, so she would appreciate prayers. We want to keep the Israel situation in prayer as they basically are at war right now with the terrorism. And, and like I uh, said last night at the Saturday service, um, I actually was privilege to be go into the Gaza Strip when I went to Israel, which only about 1% of all tourists get to do that. So I know where everything has been happening, and it's very scary. We want to keep Don Richards in our prayers. He underwent surgery on Friday, um, and he's in the hospital, but doing very well. Um, they got what they needed to get, and he should be getting out tomorrow. We want to pray for all those who are traveling. There are so many in our congregation that aren't here this weekend because they're off. There are a number of weddings were happening. People are traveling to see family for the long Columbus Day weekend. So we pray for all, of, all who are traveling. There are a number of people with colds and just regular illnesses right now. So we pray that they feel better too. Um, we pray for Jody Zelenik's mother-in-law, Carol. She, after her stroke on her birthday, um, has had good days and bad days, but she's undergoing more therapy, and things are slowly but surely improving. A joy in that Doug and Sue Ray are happy to announce that their son Aaron got married last weekend in Arizona to Brittany, so congratulations to, to them. Um, we pray for all those who have cancer, of course, including um, Paul Kautz and Elizabeth Anderson. We also want to lift up Christy Gramer's cousin, who was moved to Aperion, good and bad, out of the hospital, but not able to go home yet, as well as Christy's friend Kathy, who recovers well after her brain surgery. So I think those are the ones that I have for this week. If you'll please bow your heads with me for the pastoral prayer, then we'll say our Lord's Prayer together. Lord, we live in constant tension. There's so much pull and push in our lives, from time constraints to family and work pressures to figuring out what sides we're supposed to take in this world. In the midst of all this, we feel you calling us away into the quiet, into the sacred spaces. Yet at the same time, we feel the heat and crush of the urgent. Needs are all around, pressing us for answers, pushing us for help, pulling us for time. Yet we cannot fully engage these needs without the perspective that only you can bring from our time in the quiet. So grant us grace, Lord, to know when to retreat and when to engage. Give us ears to hear you in the quiet and eyes to see you through the haze of urgency. And then provide us the energy and wisdom to move forward doing what you call us to do in this world you created. As we do this, we ask that you attend to our prayer requests. We know that you hear millions of these every day, but you do care about each of them. Allow us to know that you are working on each person and situation, as then we can point to you and help others believe in your never-failing love. Bless each of us as we do our best in this world, and help us to always rely on you, as did your Son, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And we take the time, of course, to say thank you to everyone who helps out with 
the service, again, everything that goes into it um, during the whole week as well as on the day. And we say thank you also to those who are um, giving money to the church's ministry. If you are here in the sanctuary, you are welcome to put any offerings in the plates that are located at the exits of the sanctuary. If you're worshiping with us at home, you're welcome to mail them in, put them in the locked white box outside of the um, main doors, or give through PayPal. If you'll please bow your heads with me for our um, offering prayer, and then we'll stand as you're able as we sing our doxology. For the land you've given us, for the rich abundance that surrounds us, for all who lead us toward the life you want for us, we give thanks, ever giving God. May generosity of mind, heart, and wallet divert us from the pursuit of things that do not satisfy. Lord, bless and use our offerings of self and substance. Amen. standing for our closing hymn which is pass it on this even though it talks about spring this is one that pat requested to play that's a good thing pat verse three verses of number 572 pass it on so much for being here today and thanks especially to Pat for filling in for Charlie allowing him to have a little bit of a break so we appreciate your 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 um, talent we truly do so before we leave let us join in our unison benediction we go into the days ahead with strength in the spirit and confidence in Christ may peace be within and among us Amen. Go in the peace, love, and joy of our Lord. Amen. Amen.